Okay, so welcome to the homotopy type theory electronic seminar talks. This is the last regular talk of the season, but we have a surprise announcement for hottest fans, which is that we're running the hottest conference of 2020 uh, in June. Chris and I are running it. It's a week-long conference, June 15th to 19th, and uh, the basic information is now posted linked to from the hottest webpage. So you can go there to see uh, the list of speakers. Um, anyway, so this week, uh, for our final speaker of the semester, we have Matthew Weaver from Princeton, and his title is A Constructive Model of Directed Univalence in Bicubical Sites. Go ahead, Matthew. So, uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, this is joint work with Dan Licata. So to get started, what is directed type theory? So, um, uh, Emily, Riel, and Mike Schulman have defined a type theory for infinity categories. Um, so, in particular, you have infinite dimensions of homotopical structure along with one dimension of uh, categorical structure in your types. And they have a model in bisimplicial sets. Um, and so, the general idea of how you do this is you first start by uh, beginning with some model of homotopy type theory. Um, you then add a notion of morphism types. You can then define infinity categories and univalent infinity categories um, internally um, by defining predicates on types. And then you can also define a predicate for uh, covariant vibrations. So in particular, this predicate, uh, this vibration B uh, depends covariantly, covariantly on the type A and the fibers of B are um, categorically discrete. So they're infinity groupoids. So we have this notion of covariant vibration. Um, and then from this, uh, you could also then define a universe of covariant vibrations. So the uh, basically it's the infinity category of spaces and continuous, fu continuous functions. And um, Emily Real, Evan Cavallo, and Christian Sattler have uh, defined this externally in the bisimplicial model and shown uh, directed univalence holds in this universe. So in particular, the morphisms in this universe are continuous functions as we would like, given we want to think of it as the infinity category of spaces. So that's kind of the existing work on directed type theory. And so can we do this constructively? Uh, so the general idea is let's kind of copy this pattern, um, but instead start with cubicle type theory, a kind of constructive version of homotopy type theory. And then we can add a second cubicle interval and use that to define our morphism types. And then we have ways to uh, the LOPS construction. Uh, Licata, Orton, Pitts, and Spitters defined uh, a way to define universes constructively using the internal logic of a topos. So we can, in theory, define uh, the universe of covariant vibrations internally. Um, and then that would be to construct directed univalence for this universe. However, um, it's a bit trickier than one would hope, so it doesn't quite work in this super smooth fashion, but we have still managed to make it work. So let's get started. So just to begin with, we're just going to kind of use the standard cubicle, cubicle techniques and see how far we get. Um, so defining bicubicle directed type theory. Um, so we're going to do this in the style of Orton Pitts. Um, so just to kind of refresh how they define cubicle type theory, we're going to begin with the internal logic of some topos. So we're kind of just starting with a topos. Um, then you add an interval i, or kind of more semantically, you would add, add axioms requiring the topos contains an object corresponding to an interval. Um, then you define some generating co-fibrations uh, that relate to this interval. You can then use all this to define a filling problem to specify your confibrations or your well-behaved types. Um, you can then define a universe of confibrations and then construct univalence for this universe. So now for directed type theory, what's this going to look like? Well, we're going to begin with cubicle type theory. We're now going to add a second interval. That's the directed interval. We're now going to add more co-fibrations corresponding to this new interval. Um, we're now then can define a filling problem that classifies the covariant vibrations. 
we can then define a universe of these covariant vibrations. And lastly, uh, we can then ideally construct directed univalence for this universe. So to get started, let's add an interval. So in uh, cubical type theory, you kind of add an axiom or require that there is a type for the interval and it has two distinct endpoints, zero and one. Um, so in our work, we kind of used the Cartesian cubes for our base cubical type theory, but it's not, it uh, doesn't really matter which you use. We're kind of agnostic to the choice of cubical type theory. And so now for the directed interval, we do the same thing. We add an interval type. We add two distinct endpoints. Um, and we also choose to add connections. So we can say for two interval variables, x and y, we can consider the interval variables as the least of x and y, and it's only the greatest of x and y. So an equation specifying how these work. So in particular, we chose to use the Dedekind cubes for our directed cube structure. And so why do we use the Dedekind cubes? Uh, for the directed structure? Well, as things are directed, it's nice to be able to talk about inequality of uh, directed dimension variables, because and we can define that using equality. So x is less than or equal to y if x is the smaller of x and y. And then also, we have to add two axioms to make things work, and they are true in our model, but they're not particularly interesting for the rest of this talk. So we now have intervals. Then we have to specify some generating co-fibrations. So first off, we define uh, co-fibrations as a sub-object of the sub-object classifier. So we're basically just picking out some special monos in the category. Um, we require that these uh, the cofibrations are closed under conjunction, disjunction, false, and true. And for cubical type theory, we additionally need to be able to talk about uh, when two interval variables are equal and uh, be able to quantify over an interval variable. And uh, just also just to clarify, um, again, we are uh, defining we are just requiring that these are contained in the monomorphisms that are cofibrations. We're not saying that it's exclusively generated by these things. We're just adding axioms requiring that at least these things are um, cofibrations. So, in particular, our cofibrations could be all monos, it could be decidable monos, but at least needs to contain this. Um, and now we have this second directed interval. And we're going to also add some uh, cofibrations that relate to monos for this interval. So in particular, we can talk about, again, when two directed interval variables are equal, and we can quantify over them. So now, for the next step, we can define our filling problems that classify the well-behaved types. So first, thinking of these as a uh, predicates and the internal logic of a topos, we can define the filling pro problem for um, confibrations. In the Cartesian cubical model, basically what it says is that if we have any uh, type that's indexed over an uh, interval variable and we have something at, over that uh, interval at, from any point i, we can move to any other point J. So in particular, we can kind of transport any way along an interval so from any starting point to any ending point. While for the directed interval, as we want this to correspond to um, covariance, instead, we have a similar looking problem, but basically we're saying if we have something at zero in a type, we can move it to one and nowhere else. So, and in particular, the second filling problem is the same one that's used in the CCHM uh, model of cubical type theory. But in their cube category, they also have reversals. So 
you can go from one to zero using that. But as we don't have reversals, we're using the Dedekind cube category. This really does only go in a covariant direction. So just to make this a bit more clear, as those predicates are not the easiest to read, there's also pictures. So the idea in the Cartesian cubicle type theory is if you have some partially defined path uh, t and some total term b that's at some point j along the interval i, we can move along i to the, any other point k on, along that path. So that's how filling works there for con. While for covariance, what we're saying is that we have now something over a directed interval, and we have a partial term t, and a total term b that's only over, uh, that's only exists when i equals 0. We can then fill to get something when i equals 1. And another thing to note is that as we have connections, we can compose those with paths we're filling along and actually go from, for example, anywhere along the interval to 1 or start at 0 and go to anywhere in the middle. Um, so while it looks like we're just going using the endpoints, you can actually uh, manipulate it to kind of move anywhere so long as it's in the 0 to 1 direction covariantly. And now we have kind of our filling problems. So now the goal is to define universes that classify the types that satisfy these filling problems. So as mentioned earlier, we can use this internal predicate and apply the LOPS construction to define a universe that classifies these vibrations. So in cubicle type theory, we can get find the con universe. Um, and then we can also use this construction to get the universe of covariant vibrations. However, one detail to note is that the predicate that defines covariant vibrations is itself con. So when we use the LOPS construction, we can restrict the con universe specifically to get a universe that's smaller than the con universe, um, that's the covariant universe. And then in particular, all the types um, in the covariant universe are also con. And the decoding function turns a covariant type into a con type. So we have, so our covariant universe contains things that are both covariant and con. And having done all that, the goal is then to define univalence. So the key idea in cubicle type theory is that we have these types called glue types, and they attach equivalence structure to path structure and allow us to, in particular, turn an equivalence into a path. So for directed type theory, as the goal is for functions to be equivalent to morphisms, we're going to use a similar glue type that attaches functions to morphism structure. So how do we do this? Basically, we have this type. It's indexed by a directed interval variable i. And for any function, f from a to b, we can get this type. And when i equals 0, it's definitionally equal to a. And when i equals 1, it's definitionally equal to b. So in particular, it turns a function into a morphism. So having done this, we can prove that this uh, new glue type we use is con and covariant. So it is in our covariant universe, which is what we wanted. And we also can prove that the covariant universe is con and has path univalence. So using these kind of standard cubicle techniques, we have the following. In particular, we can turn a morphism into a function using just uh, covariance. Now that we have this blue type thing, we can turn a function into a morphism. Uh, we can prove that functions are a retract of morphisms. So in particular, if we take a function, turn it into a morphism, and then turn it back into a function, that's a path equal to where we started with. So we almost have directed univalence. But we can't quite show 
that morphisms are also retractive functions. So to, what we, to clarify what we can define, uh, we have this picture. So P is a morphism in the covariant universe. And then DUA DCOE of P is what we get from the round trip. As it's a morphism in the universe, it's in particular a family of types indexed by a directed interval variable at both endpoints. Uh, at the zero endpoint, both are definitionally equal to A. And at the right endpoint, they're definitionally equal to P, B. But in the middle, we need to show that also we have an equivalence everywhere along this interval in order to complete the fact that these two things are actually equal, path equal. And unfortunately, we can only define a function that goes from uh, the path P to what it comes out from the round trip. And uh, to complete directed new valence, we need to be able to invert this function. Um, and how that it does not seem uh, obvious how to do that using just these techniques. So before I move on, I guess, are there any questions on this first half? We're going to shift gears a little bit. Yes. If not, we can then continue forward and figure out how we solve this problem. So what next? So looking at the proof that was done for directed univalence in the bisimplicial model, it depends on the fact that weak equivalences of bisimplicial sets are object-wise weak equivalences of simplicial sets. So in particular, if you think about uh, kind of, of thinking about the, the weak equivalences in the homotopical simplicial sets at every dimension when you, of directed structure. And so, uh, semantically, there are kind of three uh, like often used model structures that give you level-wise weak equivalences, but each of them gives you three separate challenges. So, you know, you can use the Reedy model structure to kind of exponentiate, to, to kind of define a new model structure on um, bicubical sets here, but the issue is that the Dedekind cubes aren't Reedy, so this isn't going to work. You could consider the projective model structure, but not all types uh, end up being vibrant that we need if we were to use that. And then there's the injective model structure, but uh, the injective model structure is not easily defined as a cofibrantly generated model structure, which is the kind of model structure we like to use when defining a type theory. However, we're going to now kind of take our inspiration for solving this problem from the injective model structure. Um, if anyone here heard my talk this past summer at the HOT conference, I was leaning towards using a more Reedy approach. Um, but we're not going to do that because while it did end up giving us a model with directed univalence, there were some issues with constructivity um, because we basically had to be able to decide if an arbitrary cell was degenerate or not, which isn't always a decidable problem. So to kind of get access to this injective model structure, we're gonna use something called the Cobar construction. So uh, Mike Schulman has some work where he can classify an injectively fibrant object A. So it's a, A is a functor from a category C into a model category M. And uh, A is fibrant in the injective model structure. If for every object in C, a evaluated at C is fibrant in the underlying model structure M, so it's object-wise fibrant. And A is equivalent to cobar of A, where A is some, where cobar is an endofunctor acting on this uh, functor category. So that seems like a reasonable way to think about uh, fibrant objects. And then uh, Kakan and Roosh have recently internalized this cobar construction into a more syntactic setting and have constructively shown that weak equivalences are object-wise uh, using their definition of COBAR. So our idea is to use this internal notion of COBAR and prove that for every type we care about, it's equivalent to uh, its COBAR. And thus its weak equivalences are object-wise, which is the goal. And this does actually work and we're able to complete directed univalence constructively. 
Um, but just to um, qualify it, uh, we have yet to actually have a formal connection between the Kovar construction given by Kokand and Roosh um, to that of uh, the kind of standard classical Kovar construction. So in particular, while well, I did start this by saying we're considering the injective model structure, there's no actual formal claims that what we're defining is the injective model structure. It's just inspired by the injective model structure. So no more models, category three. <laughs> so to start with, Kahn and Roosh define a general framework for internalizing Lex operators and defining model of type theory that localize um, the type theories using them. So just kind of, so in particular, you can kind of consider uh, some uh, strict Lex endo functor that acts on your types that also is equipped with a natural transformation from the identity functor to it. And then the idea is to restrict the model of type theory to only those types that are stacks, or in particular where this natural transformation at the type A is, a, is an equivalence. So we're kind of restricting our type theory using this general pattern. And in particular, Kobar is such a Lex operator. So to start with, uh, going back to this Orton Pitt style, we're going to add some more axioms that must hold in our topos. So in particular, there has to be a Lex endo functor D. It has, as it's an endo functor, it has an action on morphisms that uh, makes sense with composition and is the identity on identity functions. Uh, it also is passed to have the idea to define this natural transformation. So in particular, we have a natural transformation from A to D of A, or I guess from the identity to D. Um, and it is indeed a strict natural transformation. Additionally, there's a coherence condition about um, how uh, the functorial action of D interacts with the natural transformation. And we can kind of get a type out of an element of the endo functor on the universe, which allows us to, in particular, define a kind of dependent version of the endo functor. So if we have a, a, a vibration indexed over A, we can also get a vibration indexed over D of A. And now with all these crazy axioms, we can actually add the final axiom saying that D is Lex. So basically what that means is that if we take this endo functor's action on a sigma type, it's isomorphic to the sigma type where we push the D inside. So D of sigma AB is sigma D of A, this dependent version of D on B. So that's, and with this alone, for an arbitrary Lex endo functor, uh, we can prove that if uh, B, a depend, a vibration B is a family of stacks, then the pi type pi AB is also a stack. And if A is a stack and B is a family of stacks, then the sigma type is a stack. So just if we recall, our goal was to show that all the types we care about are stacks um, to get uh, to finish structuring the valence. But um, unfortunately for the other types, such as path, hom, and glue, we need to know a bit more about D and eta, as in particular they deal with some of the specific structures of the category. So we're now going to start thinking about Kovar specifically. So the main idea about this Kovar construction is that it kind of is a way to classify homotopy coherent transformations. So a natural transformation from A to Kovar of B uh, is supposed to correspond to a homotopy coherent transformation. So basically what that means is that um, where you have all these equations that say when a natu natural transformation is natural, uh, we want them only to hold up to path equality instead of strict equality. Um, and so in order to eventually define this Kovar operator, which I'm now going to start referring to by D again, 
uh, we're going to first define a second operator E uh, as a building block. And so the general idea for E is that uh, an element of E of A at some uh, Dedekind cube X is an element of the uh, A of X along with a choice for the action of every morphism into X. So we're kind of allowing, so we're kind of weakening so where you can now specify how all the morphisms act. Um, and we're not really thinking about it being coherent anymore. So kind of totally kind of forgetting the categorical structure that was there. And then uh, for our cobar construction, D, we're now going to, um, it's going to use this in the definition. And the idea is that for every uh, chain of n composable morphisms into a Dedekind cube x, an element of d of a of x is going to be a choice of how the substitution acts um, along all of those morphisms. And they have to be weakly coherent in some sense. Um, so it's kind of, but given things are homotopical, it ends up being kind of arbitrarily dimensional, hence you can do it for all compositions. And so we'll see this in a bit more detail and hopefully it'll make more sense then with some pictures. Uh, but first, the definition of E is relatively straightforward. Um, basically, given a bicubical set A, we can define E of A at the Dedekind cube X to be um, a family of elements of a of y for every morphism that goes from y to x, so for every y. So it's just kind of, again, we just get to pick elements for every single morphism that goes into the kind of set we're considering. And then from this, we can kind of get an action of uh, morphisms on elements by composition, and there's a natural transformation that's basically just saying uh, we send an element to the actual real action of the substitution that we have from our uh, functor A instead of picking an arbitrary one. And so considering um, now D, the cobar operator, just kind of first off, the general type of it is that, so for every natural number N, we're going to have an n-dimensional cube of uh, in, uh, okay. so basically for every natural number n, we're going to consider an n plus one chain of morphisms into x, and we're going to have an n-dimensional cube at the domain of that chain. And that's going to be kind of, so it's a family indexed by, uh, n plus one chains of morphisms. Um, and these families have to satisfy some conditions that are rather confusing if you look at them directly. So instead, let's actually look at some pictures of what this looks like, because then it makes a lot more sense. So when n equals 0, we are going to send a morphism to a point in its domain. So in particular, to make things simple, I'm going to assume that this Morphism is the identity. So when n equals 0, we send the identity morphism to some element of A of x. So we've kind of picked out the point. So now, when n equals 1, this element is going to send a chain of two composable, uh, compatible morphisms to a line. And again, we're going to think about the first one always being the identity. So in particular, we have one non-trivial morphism. And so now we've selected this A of 1 as kind of the kind of a the action of this morphism F on the element A of 0. And it has to be path equal to the actual action of F on the element A of 0. And so the kind of the equations I didn't show specify that we have this path. Um, and then when n equals 2, we're now considering a chain. We're setting chains of three morphisms to a square, but we're really going to just think about a triangle inside of the square. Um, and so we now get to pick 
this element a of two at the domain of the chain, so an a of z. And it needs to be, again, there needs to be a path from it to the action of the morphism on what we picked at the last step and the step before. So these all kind of have to cohere. And it has to agree now with how the different ways you can compose these three morphisms. Um, and furthermore, not only do the points all have to have paths between them, but there's also the surface is saying how the coherent paths are also coherent. So uh, it's basically ends up being rather complicated, but it's basically the idea is that it's a kind of specifying the data you would need to give to define a natural transformation that's only weakly natural. And this continues for arbitrary dimensions. Um, and from this, uh, using the specifics, we're able to- Matthew, can I uh, interrupt you? Yes, please do. So, so firstly, are you, are you talking us through the Kalkhand and Rook internal COBAR construction yes. right now? Okay. Exactly. So, so um, I guess the, my, the question is going to be how this relates to the sort of categorically defined COBAR construction. So, yes. so um, in particular, uh, so A started life as a cubicle set. So it's some sort of functor. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that I typically understand the COBAR construction is you start with something like A, uh, in this case, a co or a cubicle set. Uh, then you form like a co-simplicial object in cubicle sets. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then you do some sort of like totalization to get a cubicle set back. And it kind of looks to me that like the E thing is the E operator is maybe defining the, the co-simplicial object that would be familiar. So, so, mm -hmm. so the, a co-simplicial object is in particular for every natural number N, you get a cubicle set. And it, it looks to yeah. me like those cubicle sets are like A and then E of A and then E squared of A and E cubed exactly. and so on. Yeah. Um, but I've always been confused about, uh, so, I mean, if you want to kind of product that up to get a single cubicle set again, um, you're, you're kind of taking use of, or you're taking into account the maps between those objects I just described, the A and the E of A and the E squared of A. And it seems to me that those maps are like simplicial maps. So index, like they're, mm -hmm. they correspond to the maps in the simplex category. Um, so is that still the case? Is there some co-simplicial object going on in here that's then summed up? Or is, is that converted into like a co-cubical object somehow? And um, so yeah, um, that make any sense? This, <laughs> so. It definitely does, because I had some very similar thoughts when I was first reading their paper and was confused. Okay. So the one main difference is that it's the totalization of a co-semi-simplicial object. Okay. The semi-simplicial morphisms are the same as the cubicle morphisms in this case. So it kind of, you could think like, they, you can kind of define them the same way so it's easier to internalize. Like syntactically, they look the same. Okay, but the, I mean, the composition structure, I wouldn't expect to be the same. So like, for instance, between the n cube and the n plus one cube, there are, what is it, two to the n plus one? Yeah, yeah, maps, there's, there's more of them. them. Yeah, there's more of them, but at least there's, there's an inclusion, I guess, from okay. in such a way that it kind of, you can kind of build the totalization of the semi-simplicial object inside of the cubes. So it's it's like, it's it's a bit like, like I only have like an informal and precise understanding of it, and mm -hmm. I've been wanting to work it out better, but it basically, yeah, you're kind of hacking in a semi, a uh, kind of a co-semi-simplicial thing inside of a cubicle thing in a way it kind of works out, but I don't have any formal understanding of an actual, how it connects. Okay, thanks. That's a, and they, they do have a, I missed this paper apparently. Uh, there's a paper about this somewhere. Is that? Uh, oh. Or is there a paper about oh, this? Oh, oh yes, yeah, yeah. There's, oh yeah, there's a, mm -hmm like an archive preprint that is like from in January, I think posted. Great. All right. Thanks very much. And just to, to follow up, is the, is this inclusion you're talking about illustrated in that N equals two line where you only drew a triangle? Yeah. Square? Yeah. Like we're kind of just, cause in particular the boundaries of a triangle still exist in the Cartesian cubes. 
So we're kind of like the equations that we impose on you really are only restricting some portion of the square. But because it's all still definable in the square, but in theory, there's a full square there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so there's this cobar thing. It's somewhat confusing, as a very confusing, but it's definable. Uh, and uh, regardless, the important thing is that having defined it, um, we can now prove some additional facts about how this uh, COBRA operator D interacts with our other type formers. So in particular, uh, D of a path type uh, is now is it isomorphic to path of, of D of A. Um, we can kind of push it inside. Similarly for HOM types. And uh, lastly, it also commutes with the glue type we use for directed univalence. So we have these isomorphisms. Um, and in our formalization, we actually have to talk about how these compute and relate to eta, but I didn't put them on the sides because it's unnecessary. Um, and with these isomorphisms, we can now show that if um, we have a stack A, then the path types and HOM types for A are also stacks. And similarly, if A and B are stacks, um, then for any function from A to B, the glue type we define for directed valence is also a stack. So in particular, now every type we care about is a stack. So we can now start looking towards completing directed univalence. So given all this, we now have kind of two final steps. So first off, we want to show that if we have a function f from a to b between stacks, if at every directed cube, it f is then a weak equivalence of cubical sets, f is also equivalent of bicubical sets. And Kakan and Rush have proven this constructively. And then the last part is this DUA eta fund that we had before that we wanted to be an equivalence. Um, we also need to prove that it is an object wise equivalence of cubical sets. And uh, this also is true. And our proof is basically the same as that given by Evan, Emily, and Christian, although it's in bi cubical sets instead of bi subversal sets. And finally, we can also define a universe of covariant stacks where directed univalence will actually hold true. Um, and it can just be defined as the sigma type here. So in conclusion, with all of this, here's what we actually um, have completed. So we have a constructive model of type theory in bicubical sets, and it has a universe of vibrant types and covariant vibrations such that uh, we can decode a covariant vibration into a con vibration. Uh, UCON is closed for pi type sigma types, dependent path types, dependent morphism types, and contains smaller universes of covariance uh, stacks and smaller uh, con universes. Uh, the covariant stack universe is closed under pi types as long as the domain is kind of a fixed closed thing, as otherwise it would not be covariant. Um, it's also closed for sigma types, dependent path types, and dependent morphism types. Uh, both universes are path univalent. And uh, the covariant stack universe also um, has directed univalence. And all of the Orton Pitt style work is also formalized in ICA. And uh, that's everything. So thanks. Okay, great. Let's um, all do our usual silent applause for Matthew. And we have lots of time for questions. So uh, if you want to ask a question, just unmute your microphone and go ahead. I can try to get the ball rolling. Um, so can you uh, say something about how you would, uh, you would use the fact that you have this constructive model? Um, 
what, do, what does that exactly tell you about the theory and what would the implications be? Well, I guess uh, one of the main goals I have for this is to um, be able to uh, start using these techniques for software verification, actually. Because um, in particular, in computer science, you have a lot of structures that are directed more so. Um, and so in particular, you could imagine, for example, if you want to formalize some fact about type theory, you could define uh, your context as a category and then define terms as a covariant vibration over it and hopefully take advantage of the structure to make things easier. Um, so I guess that's one of my main motivations. But in order to do that, we also need a notion of directed hit, which is uh, the next step. OK, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, I think Steve's got a question. Thanks. Nice presentation there, Matthew. Um, in the bisimplicial case, which I guess you're familiar with, the proof goes maybe differently. You don't need the Cobar construction. So, um, yeah, because uh, yeah. I mean, what's the difference here that requires that? Um, I guess the main thing is so. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but in uh, the bisimplicial case, the Reedy model structure and injective model structure coincide. So in theory, the Reedy fibrate, because they're considering the Reedy model structure in bisimplicial sets, and then define their kind of uh, fibrate objects using that perspective. But also it would, in theory, I guess, be true that you could use a Cobar weight classification of the injective model structure as well. Um, okay. so. Just to follow up then, maybe if instead of the Dedekind cubes, you took the Cartesian cubes in both dimensions there, you could use the fact that the Cartesian cubes are generalized Reedy and then you could avoid the Cobar construction that way? Um, potentially, although I'm not sure how expressing some of the kind of more categorical stuff you wanna be able to describe would work because um, using the fact that we can talk about inequalities um, or like in generally we can now actually define still like simplices in the language of um, Dedekind cubes. So we can talk about commuting triangles and things to talk about when a type is Siegel. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what would happen right. from like a user standpoint with the Cartesian cubes. Okay, thanks. Okay, more questions? Okay, I'll ask another question. Okay. If if we have, I'm I'm thinking about this, the fact that you have these bicubical sets, but they're different in the two different mm -hmm. dimensions. So now I've conceded that you need the Dedekind cubes in the second dimension. Let's put the Dedekind cubes into the first dimension too. And then yep. instead of having Cartesian and Dedekind, you have both. And then there's a trick that you can do which I think Benno Vandenberg and Ike Mordike did in constructing a weakly univalent, a univalent weak universe or something like that, where you do a certain pullback along the diagonal in order to make a homotopy quotient. Um, maybe Benno is here, he might remember how that worked. And you might be able to do the same kind of trick here. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Um. No. <laughs> Sorry, what is what is the trick you're you're referring to? If going from <laughs> going from the bisimplicial to the simplicial oh, by okay. pulling back along the diagonal. Oh, okay. And it it gives you a homotopy quotient of a simplicial object. Yeah, yeah. Um I have no idea. Okay. Well, it's an old paper by Vandenberg and Mordike, so old that Vandenberg doesn't even remember it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'll look at it. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks for that. And remember, we're, we welcome comments, any kind of discussion.
Well, I find this stuff fascinating, but I don't understand it. I really need to learn more category theory and type theory <laughs> first. Not really a question. <laughs> Okay, well, last call for, for questions. Okay, well, let's thank Matthew again. And uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the last regular talk of the hottest season, but we do have the hottest conference of 2020 coming up June 15th to 19th. So check out the webpage for more information. And I hope to see you then.